How would you rate your life on a one to 10 scale overall? How would you rate your life? That was a question I asked myself back in the year 2000. I gave myself a seven. I thought, my life is pretty good. I've got a warm bed, I've got shelter, I've got a good job. I have everything, I even have an electric toothbrush. I, I had everything I needed to take care of myself. So, and yet I was wondering, what do I need to do in order to get to, let's say, an eight or nine or a 10? And I wasn't sure. I have a degree in religion and I was, thinking, well, maybe I need to go back to the books and maybe I can get some answers there. And I was thinking about what Moses did. He went to get his answers. He went up Mount Sinai, up high in the mountain to, to get some of uh, the Ten Commandments. Muhammad went to Mount Hira to get the first revelation of the Holy Quran. And even the Buddha went into the wilderness to get his first enlightenment. And so I was thinking, hmm, and what about Jesus? Jesus also had his most spiritual, intense experience in the desert when he confronted the devil. And that was one of the most momentous parts of his life. So what are the prophets teaching us? The prophets are teaching us that perhaps some of the answers to life's most profound questions lie in the wilderness. That's where you can find some of the answers to, that you seek. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. What, what else does religion teach us? It's that pilgrimages are also another way to find the truth. If you look at El Camino Santiago, which crosses northern Spain, it's a, it's a route that people still do today, and it's very popular among Christian pilgrims. And that's not the only pilgrimage. You have the Hajj, which is what Muslims do. They go to Mecca, and then they go around the Kaaba. This is what is considered the fifth pillar of being a Muslim. It's such a transformative journey. It, in fact, for many Muslims, they may come Muslims once they've completed that fifth pillar of Islam. And so for me, there's interesting parallels of pilgrimages as well as wilderness. But it's not just in the religious tradition. Look at the secular tradition. You have John Muir who went, you know, John Muir went into the Sierra Nevada to, to commune with nature. And you also have Walden written by Henry David Thoreau. That was also a pilgrimage into nature. And so I thought, well, why not combine these two ideas of wilderness and pilgrimage into one idea and to maybe get the answers of what I need to do in order to bring my life to a 7, 8, 9, and above, to a 10. So I thought about the Appalachian Trail, and that's what I decided to do. It's about 2,200 miles long, about 3,500 kilometers, and it stretches between Maine and Georgia. Now, most people go north on the Appalachian Trail. It takes about six months of, of hiking to do. And so uh, basically you're going from... Uh, Maine to Georgia covering all these miles. In my case, I decided to go the opposite way. about only 10% of the people who were going south. And I started at Mount Katahdin, which is the tallest mountain in Maine. And then I realized, you know what? After just a few days of hiking, I thought, this is probably the dumbest idea of getting wilderness, you know, wisdom from the wilderness. This is, if you look at Lisa's back, it's covered in mosquito bites. And she's pulling herself up in the roots of, by the roots of trees to complete the trail. This was hard. This was difficult. This, how, do you con how do you think deep thoughts in nature when all of a sudden you hear the sound of in your ear nonstop and you're swatting yourself all the time? If you look at the attrition on the trail, it's incredible. Roughly about 10% drop out just in the first week. So they tell their, their significant other, honey, I'm going to be gone for like six months. Six days, oh, I'm back already. And it's, it's because it's so difficult and the trail is, is a lot harder than they expected. In fact, by the end, 80% have dropped out of the Appalachian Trail. And so if you think about that, uh, that's yet perhaps the reason why we're so, that you get such deep thoughts on the trail. Maybe that is what separates those who do it and those who don't, they come away with lessons and perhaps because it's difficult. And so we were able to get to Georgia, and one of the lessons I learned was to hike your own hike. And the idea of hike your own hike is that a lot of people will say, hey, no, you're wearing the wrong shoes there. Oh, no, no, that backpack is too heavy. You're doing too many miles per day. People will give you all sorts of advice on the trail, and then you have to think, well, actually, you should hike your own hike. In other words, listen to your bliss. Do what makes you happy. And so that was one of the key lessons I learned from the trail itself, is to hike my own hike and to not be obsessed about what other people think. There were seven other lessons, seven lessons in total that I learned from the trail, but that was what I felt was the core lesson. Now, there was another thing I was thinking about on the trail. 
I was, I went to Harvard Business School and at Harvard Business School we talked about how to make a billion dollars, how to make a billion dollar company raise a billion dollars and we spent a lot of times obsessing about this issue. Now, in my case, I was asking myself a totally different question and I think a much more profound and interesting question on the trail is, what would you do with your time, your time, if you had a billion dollars? How would you spend your days? You wake up in the morning and you do what? Whatever the answer to that question is, is that's probably your passion. That's what you love to do. That's what you would do for free. And so I thought to myself, well, for me, what I would really love doing is to just travel the world. That's what I would do. I don't have a billion dollars and I only have a million dollars, but that's what I would do. And so I would just wander and explore and learn from, uh, from others and learn from nature. So I said, well, why not just re quit my job, my corporate job that I had at the time, and then do that, restructure my life. I'll, I'll take a big pay cut. I'll make no income for a while, but that was my idea. And so I decided to go on the Pacific Crest Trail. This was about five years after the Appalachian Trail. Now, the Pacific Crest Trail uh, is 25% longer than the Appalachian Trail. It stretches between Mexico and Canada. Now, most people go north, I went south. So I started up in Canada and went through Washington State, Oregon State, through the Cascade Mountain Range, and then through the Sierra Nevada in California, and then finally finished in the Mexican border. It's about 2,700 miles, about 4,200 kilometers, and it took about f four months of hiking and sleeping out in the woods. Um, this is a picture of me right at the beginning of the trail uh, in Canada. And I didn't go alone on this. I went with Mayu Reisman. She's an Estonian, and she had never been on such a big journey, nor, and uh, this was kind of shocking. And in fact, after the first week, she quit um, because there was just nonstop snow in Washington State. It was just covered in snow. You couldn't see the trail. It was very hard. But she, after taking about a week off, she decided to regather her strength and then go out there again and, and complete the trail. And she was very uh, strong about it. In fact, if you look at her feet on the trail, at one point in the trail, they were completely destroyed. Um, and yet she got up and was able to persevere and went on till the end. And one of the things that motivated us, of course, is the views. It's the solitude. It's that ability to be away from cell phones, from the internet, and from all these distractions. And it's a luxury that doesn't cost much money. In fact, it's, you're, just, you're sleeping outside, and so you're just paying for your food effectively. That's all you need to do. And so finally, when we got to the end of the trail, we were able to uh, celebrate at the Mexican border and having completed that journey. And that's when I told Mayu, you know what, I'm gonna go to Estonia and live in uh, Estonia, and then we're gonna travel around Eastern Europe, and I'll write a book about that. And so that's what I told her that I would do on the trail. Uh, in the end, what I ended up doing was not that, and in fact, uh, those plans went awry. And, and to explain why that plan didn't work, I have to tell you the story about my father. My dad was born in France, and he, lived there until he was 18 years old. And he then moved to Argentina at the age of 18 and he lived there for seven years. He was kind of an adventurer. He, he liked his motorcycle and he liked to travel around. And, uh, and eventually he immigrated to the United States, to San Francisco, in fact. My mom is from Santiago, Chile, and she left Chile and met my father in San Francisco. They fell in love and uh, eventually got married and a few years after that, they had us, children, uh, my, my brother and I. And uh, I would say that our family was, you know, pretty good. Uh, we had, uh, we just, maybe I would get scolded in three different languages. That was the main difference. But uh, overall, I think I was blessed. We weren't perfect, like no family is, but, but I would say that I was uh, pretty fortunate. And uh, eventually my parents did get old, and my dad um, got cancer in his leg and they had to remove the cancer. And he, uh, the doctor suggested, because he was diabetic and he was 76 years old, that they would graft a piece of his lower back onto his leg, and that would help accelerate the healing process. Um, but he wasn't too keen on this idea um, because of the fact that it would cause pain in both places. And so about a week before the, I was gonna go to Estonia, uh, to, this had just happened right after I finished the Pacific Crest Trail. He sat me down and he said to me, Francis, if I were to commit suicide, would you think of me as a coward? And I said, no, Dad, uh, I think it takes a lot of courage to commit suicide. I don't have the balls to do that. I, I couldn't do that, but I don't think you should. And he said, yeah, well, I'm a burden to your mom. And I said, my mom loves to take care of you. 
you know, that's what she, that gives her a lot of purpose. That's what she enjoys doing. And he's like, yeah, I understand. But so that conversation kind of ended there. And I had to go to Estonia. I was going to be catching my flight. And uh, the day after I arrived in Estonia, I received a phone call from my mom. And she said, tu papa se fue, which means your dad is gone. And I had to fly back to the United States. He had taken a gun and he had shot himself in the head. And unfortunately, and the tragic thing is that he didn't even die at that instant. He, he, his heart was beating, his lungs were still working, but his brain was basically dead. So my mom had the unpleasant decision of having to pull the plug. This meant that I had to go spend time back home and leave my dreams of Estonia behind. But I thought about, after spending months with my mom, what my dad would want me to do. Would he want me to feel sorry for myself or, or mourn this whole issue? No, he would want me to pursue my dreams. He would want me to go off and continue doing what I love to do. And the reason, my purpose in life is to go out there and travel. So I decided to go and do something more ambitious and give myself more time to think. And that was to do a round trip on the Continental Divide Trail. It was about 9,000 kilometers or about 5,600 miles. I would start at the Mexican border and I walked through New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and I got to Glacier National Park in Canada, at which point I turned and walked, I would walk all the way back. Uh, this is something that never had been done before, and I knew that I would be having to walk about 35 miles a day in the wilderness alone and sleeping outside. When I told that to the border guard, he said, you'll never make it. <laughs> I was there at mile zero. And he said, you'll never make it. And in fact, when I was going through Colorado, uh, walking knee deep in snow, I had to go through about a thousand kilometers of snow. I started doubting my ability to do it, but I persevered. And I even went, uh, you know, I, was, I had no cooked food the whole time. I was just eating energy bars, trail mix, that kind of stuff. Uh, I went through nine pairs of shoes in seven months. And I got to Canada, celebrated for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then turned around and started walking back to Mexico. My dad had been in 1956, curiously, at the parting of the waters, where the, the, where the continental divide in South America, where it divides the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And there I was, 41 years later, at the parting of the waters in North America, uh, and celebrating a, a river, the only part in North America where a river actually gets diverted, both to the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, right on the continental divide. I went through fires, and I even went through, at one point, I, I was just surviving on chocolate alone. Uh, it was, I had run out of all my other food, which really got old fast. Um, it was fun for a while, but eventually it got old. But uh, from there, I eventually persevered and got to the Mexican border where I celebrated. Um, at that point, my relationship, though, with Mayu had ended, and, uh, but I still hadn't, I didn't feel like I was done traveling. I, I felt that I wanted to then pursue some more trails after that. So I decided to walk across Spain twice. The Pyrenees mountain is the mountain range that divides France and Spain. And I walked across the spine of that mountain from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. It was an amazing trip, and yet it only took about 25 days. Uh, after that, I walked across Spain again through El Camino Santiago. Um, the point is, is that a lot of people say, I know, Francis, I don't have five, six months to take off. I can't do that. I can't go on these long trips. Well, this took about three, four weeks. And so it's a much shorter journey, and yet can be equally as transformative and eye-opening uh, for you and, and have a, an intense spiritual experience, a deep, a profound, and life-changing experience. You might say, well, I'm an American. I don't have two weeks, three weeks vacation. I can't afford to even take that. Well, how about a weekend? Even just taking a weekend. For example, in my case, I went up Mont Blanc, which took 48 hours. I went alone and in trail runners, which I don't recommend doing because you'll eventually get altitude sickness once you get up over 15,000 feet. But I was able to get to the summit of the tallest mountain in Western Europe, and that, just those 48 hours, really challenged my brain and really put me in a, in a new way of looking at things uh, that I had done something I had never been able to do before. You know, the theme of this TED conference is passing the baton. So what do you have to do in order to pass a baton? First, you have to, of course, receive a baton, right? And where do you get batons? They're all over the wilderness. That's where you go off and get them. But then I realized it's not just in the wilderness. You can also find batons in strange foreign lands. You can find them all over the place. And the, your obligation is once you find these batons to pass it on to others and then to have other people learn from these, your travel experiences. And so 
I thought, well, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness. Now I need to spend time in civilization and learn and pick up batons out there. So I decided to spend three years, the last three years, traveling all 25 countries in Eastern Europe. And I want to learn what Eastern Europeans could teach us. It wasn't as expensive as you think because I did a lot of couch surfing. I lived amongst them. And the cost of living was lower than that of the United States. And so I was able to go travel all over uh, Eastern Europe for those and trying to gather the lessons. What do Eastern Europeans do better than us? What can we learn from them? And I compiled all those lessons into my second book where I tried to capture those lessons. And so for a lot of people, they're wondering, you know, what's next? My next big goal is to go to Africa, Africa and see all 54 countries in Africa. And I will, starting in 2013 to about 2016, and the idea is to start in Cairo, in Egypt, go south into Sudan, and then from there, go across to Eritrea and then the Madagascar and the Seychelles Islands and then go to South Africa and then go up the west side of Africa across northern Africa and see all 54 countries in between. I'm surely, I, I believe, and I'm sure that Africans do things better than Americans in many cases. And I want to capture those lessons and pass that baton on. Later down the road, hope to go to the Middle East and to Asia. Now, a lot of people wonder, like, how can you afford to do this? You know, are you a millionaire? Not at all. It costs a lot more. So first of all, you want to live below your means. A lot of us do the opposite. We live beyond our means. And so learn to cut back on lots of things. Learn to live simply. That will make a big difference in order to pay off your debt and then to accumulate savings. The second thing is to travel below your means. Don't necessarily go always to Paris and London. Think about other places. Don't always stay at the fanciest hotel you can stay at. Maybe do some couch surfing and you'll find ways to travel more simply. Uh, buy food at grocery stores instead of staying at fancy restaurants when you go travel. That will allow you to travel f for months. Going to a third world country is a lot more affordable than traveling in Western Europe. And so, and yet you'll be able to have a more profound experience. So here's what I want to leave you with, is that if you have a trouble, you've lost something in your life, whether it's your job, a husband, or uh, a relationship of some kind, anything that is important to you. Or you're at a, life where you're at a point in your life where you want to figure out how can I bring it up to the next level? How can I have an inflection point? I think if you go travel to some place that's exotic, some place that's different, some place that is completely foreign, whether it be in the wilderness or some far country that doesn't, where you don't even speak the language, that will change you as a person and that will transform you because you'll fire neurons in your brain that you've never fired before and you will become a better person. Thank you.